So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this fourth plenary session at the Lugano Summer School 2020. My name is Marlene Heep, and I'm Program Officer at the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation, and it's my pleasure to moderate through this plenary this afternoon. And I have the pleasure to introduce today's speaker, although I'm really conscious that I will never be able to do justice to his large competencies and vast experiences. But let me still try to introduce him, him briefly. Professor Benedetto Saraceno, very much welcome. Professor Saraceno is a trained psychiatrist and he was very actively advocating during his career for mental health reforms. He supported the establishment of a national network of community mental health in Italy. Professor Saraceno has been director of the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse of the World Health Organization and he is the secretary of the Lisbon Institute for Global Mental Health. He's also been appointed as a global ambassador of the Special Olympics. And he was actively involved in many mental health re system reforms in several Latin American countries, working as a consultant of the Pan American Health Organization. So you can see he has a huge experience and it's really my pleasure that he takes his time and shares with us this afternoon some of his views and experiences on COVID and the primary health care level and health system responses. So very much welcome, Professor Saraceno, and let me hand over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, and a special thanks to the Summer School, which has given me the opportunity to make this plenary presentation. So many other countries, and what are the potential corrections to such a disaster? Hospitals in Lombardy quickly saturated, not just because the increasing demand from severe cases requiring intensive care, but also, but also, and, and maybe mainly because less severe cases and even mild cases were not managed at home or in intermediate structure. In other words, there was no culture and no organizations to operate outside the hospital. Too many people abandoned at home with no treatment or care until many of them have worsened. Too many elders in social care residences died due to the inability of the health system to intervene in structure, which are not hospital. Hospital. Hospital has been the only answer, together with the obvious adoption of physical distancing measures, too late, too fragmented, too sensitive to pressure from industrialists, quite hostile to any lockdown. The New England Journal of Medicine published a paper on the Italian crisis. The British Medical Journal published even a letter from the president of the Italian medical doctors denouncing the failure of the public health system in some regions. Many have highlighted the Italian mistakes consisting in what? Consisting the lack of any, any extra hospital intervention and of any form of housing for quarantine and the consequent and exclusive burden put on hospitals, which quickly became not only overcrowded, but a dangerous source of infections outbreaks. Hospital was the only answer. Actually, actually, between emergency hospitalization and the civic sense of individuals respecting confinement rules and physical distancing, there was nothing. Hospital on one side, that was the only exclusive answer from the health system and the lockdown measures adopted 
individually by the citizens. Nothing in between. I, I think that the chronic disease model, the chronic disease model, may help understanding better the failure of the health system. The significant increase of chronic non-transmissible disease like cancer, diabetes, hypertension, respiratory conditions, mental disorders, and some chronic infections like HIV or TB represent a fantastic challenge to traditional models based exclusively on hospital care. Integrated models of care are needed. Medical and psychosocial support should be given at community level more than in hospital. You may object. Okay, but this is the model for chronic conditions. And the pandemic of coronavirus is an acute condition which need acute answers. But, but, you should consider that acute conditions may also benefit from chronic conditions models. You should consider that extra hospital interventions are needed also for acute conditions. That acute response does not mean automatically bed in hospital. One thing is saying, an acute condition like the pandemic needs acute response, but let's not mix up and thinking that an acute response automatically means a bed in a hospital. A strong community health system, including an efficient and effective general practitioners network should have been put into action well before this pandemic. And it was not the case in many regions of Italy. And it should have been priority for all local Italian administrations, the so-called regions. And this has not been the case. The incredible arrogance of Lombardy Regional Administration, still, still now, after the disaster, declares Lombardy Health System a world excellence. With 13,000 people dead by April 25, and many more today. It should be stated once forever that clinical excellency does not mean health system excellency. In other words, the fact that in Lombardy one may find outstanding surgeons or outstanding specialists is not a guarantee that the health system is excellent. Let's not mix up a clinical assessment of, a, of an hospital with a public health assessment of the same hospital. The failure has to do, the failure of Lombardy, this failure of Italy, the failure of many other countries has to do with a very scarce attention to the real need of general population and with the absence of any say on health systems functioning from the citizens and from the communities. I would suggest, maybe not all of you are uh, familiar with this uh, literature, I suggest you refer to the notion of deep democracy, which has been introduced by the Indian anthropologist Aryun Apadurai, and it refers to all forms of democracy from below that shape the experiences of empowerment of the residents 
of Bombay slums. It is irrelevant that Aryun Padurai conceived the notion of deep, deep democracy, having in mind the underserved and vulnerable population of the slums. What matters here is the idea of a democracy built up from below, enabling citizens to get more power and to have more say in public issues. Deep democracy is the construction of processes of democratization from below, is the development of new forms of community organization challenging the rituals of democracy, implementing radical form of empowerment. One of the most important aspects of the notion of deep democracy introduced by a Padurai is represented by all the processes of empowerment of citizens living in a defined area. If we follow Amartya Sen, the Nobel Prize, Amartya Sen, Nobel Prize, Prize of Economics, Amartya Sen conception, we could say that empowerment is a process conferring greater, greater capacities, capacity to aspire, to aspire to more well-being, to more freedom, to more power of saying. Empowerment is a process conferring greater capacity to functioning and so doing, acquiring more tools to increase freedom, well-being and power. The ties between empowerment and democracy are quite close. Conferring power, conferring powers to citizens, to citizen, citizens, excuse me, and acquiring power from institutions is a complex dynamic, which has important implication for the natural history of diseases and on the encounter between citizens who are seeking care and health institutions. Therefore, there are two vectors. The one from institutions conferring power and the one of people with no power aspiring to empowerment. This double dynamic implies radical transformation of both institutions and individuals. The French philosopher Etienne Balibar describes this process as a democratization of democracy. Individuals, citizens learn to acquire power and institutions learn to confer powers. And when we are talking about institutions in this specific case, I am thinking to health system institution. Now, if we really wish to correct the serious mistakes of many health systems, and we really wish to improve systems capacity, we will have two tasks in front of us. The first has to do with taking seriously the philosophy and the recommendations of Alma Ata. What is Alma Ata? The 1968 historic conference which conceived the notion of primary health care. Establishing strong primary health care system means going beyond the very basic idea of primary health care as just one doctor one general practitioner, because primary health care is much more, and it should provide much more 
to citizens. And the second task has to do with promoting new forms of health from below. And this is not a dream of, of myself. Good practices already exist. See, so on one hand, the failure is explained by the failure of the primary health care system. We need to establish a strong primary health care system, which is much more than they're just one doctor. And the second, we need to promote new forms of democracy from below of, in this case, of health from below. Let me briefly mention two interesting Italian experiences. One is La Casa della Salute, the House of Health. This is a network of almost 20 experiences across the entire country, from north to south. The Casa della Salute is not just a place where health is provided, but also a place where different demands, health, social needs, diminished rights, exclusion, meet at a unique crossing point and find direct or indirect answers from different types of people, health professionals, but not just health professionals, welfare professionals, volunteers, NGOs. Casa della Salute is a place where all actors of a community are together, join together, no longer primary health care, but primary care, meaning going beyond health, even if including health. Casa della Salute is a place which provides intervention aiming not just to health, but aiming at the well-being of individuals and addressing what the American anthropologist from Harvard, Arthur Kleinman, defines as a social suffering. So care is not just treatment. The second experience which is a little bit older than Casa della Salute, but geographically is much more limited. Casa della Salute is a network of 20 experiences across the country, while this is just limited in the area of the city of Trieste. The name of the experience is micro, are, micro areas. These public organizations uh, born in Trieste, not by chance, but as a natural byproduct of the Franco Basalia experience and the vast network of community mental health centers created. The main objective of micro area is the one of combining psychosocial, psychosocial uh, intervention uh, and different forms of democratic participation of the clients of the users. People are no longer just patients or users or clients, but they become active and proactive subjects of their own health and social projects. Altogether, public services, nonprofit services, charities, NGOs, um, volunteers are connected in an harmonic and coherent service offering a sort of total taking charge. These experiences have significantly decreased the inappropriate use of not necessary hospitalization. They have corrected the abuse of hospitalization. Of course, to implement all these models 
of real and concrete community and welfare best practice. It is necessary putting social determinants at the center of any health interventions. You don't need me explaining you what social determinants are and in particular social determinants of health as conceptualized and described by Sir Michael Marmot. I just remind you the definition. The social determinants of health are the conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live, and age, and a wider set of forces and systems shaping the conditions of daily life. These forces, these systems, include economic policies and systems, development agendas, social norms, social policies, and political systems. We have enough evidence about the concrete possibility of mitigating the effects of those micro social determinants which represent the usual context of environment of individuals. Health promotion, disease prevention, treatment, care, and rehabilitation. So three things, promotion, prevention, treatment, and rehabilitation should result from the synergy of three components equally powerful, individuals and communities, health professionals, and public local administrators. All new innovative organizational models should be structured within this equilateral triangle. And when I'm saying equilateral, means that the three components, individuals and communities, local administrations and health professions have the same power, the same capacity of saying and transforming the system. So it's a complex negotiation, but it's the guarantee of health becoming a real good for uh, citizens. Well, let me conclude for sure, for sure, the after pandemic emergency should avoid keeping the logic and the culture of emergency. The tyranny of emergency that Apadurai again opposes to the politics of patience. So he put in, in, in contrast the tyranny of emergency and the politics of patience. Indeed, an emergency is an event unexpected, relatively rare, with a limited duration. When we will be entering the after, it will be necessary, assuming that the threat of coronavirus or other virus will be there, unrestrainable and destined to last. Keeping the logic of emergency would exempt national and local governments from assuming the issues of epidemics as a systemic not as an exceptional issue, to be managed as a permanent normal risk. This means developing and implementing policies and intervention which should be systemic and long-lasting. It will be necessary deconstructing the paradigm of emergency, unmasking all ambiguities and reticences saying the truth will become the must. The health system should not keep the logic of emergency, thinking that increasing intensive care beds, buying additional respirators, stowing, stocking up masks, hydroalcoholic gel, and gloves will be enough. Governments tend to ignore systemic phenomena. Why? Because this requires systemic solutions. 
For example, we may say that the migrant phenomenon, instead of being addressed as a systemic, as it is, still is considered as a critical emergency, which is not true. It's a systemic problem, which requires systemic answers. The risk of epidemic should become routine for health systems. And this means that they should radically change well beyond stocking gap. And this should occur from now on. In conclusion, we should find a balance between global and local perspective. No doubt that a pandemic is a global issue requiring global guidelines, avoiding local and politically driven, politically driven strategies. No doubt that a pandemic requires global financial and economic mitigation strategies. However, let's not put too much emphasis on the idea, hope, and illusion that global dimension and perspective are omnipotent. Health systems should carefully be rethought locally. Is the local that should be innovated? Is the local that should be strengthened? Because if it is true that global is powerful, it is also true that local is real. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Saraceno, for this very inspiring talk, despite some of the technical challenges we had at the beginning. And uh, put quite some challenges on, uh, on us on, to reflect on several aspects, and I'm really looking forward to a lively discussion. So if the audience has questions, please write them in the Q&A section, and we will then read it out to Professor Saraceno. And uh, to start with, and maybe also give you some time to write down your own questions, um, let me ask one question from my side. So what do you think would be needed most that those changes you're describing uh, as necessary, like going more decentralized, less hospital focused, less emergency driven, uh, better including social determinants when offering care. Uh, what is, could be a key ingredient or a key approach uh, that those changes can really happen? What is your experience on that? But probably the most important thing is to move from an exclusive biomedical model in health. So health is much more than a biomedical model. The biomedical model is a component, is a very relevant component of health. But we can't continue thinking that health is just a matter of a medical and of, of, of a biological. Because the biological model is linear, so refuse the complexity, and is in a way individual. While we know that health is a much more complex dimension. And I think if we don't, this is a big responsibility of the university, uh, in a way training uh, future doctors, future health professionals beyond the biomedical model. I think that this is the first step to move and to, uh, to liberate ourselves from the hegemony of the exclusivity of the biomedical model. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. That would be a really kind of a shift in perception on, the, on health challenges. May I now hand over um, to Maximilian for reading out those questions which came in, in through the chat. Yes, thank you. We have uh, one question for Professor Saraceno by German Guerra. How will this concept of deep democracy might be hindered by the current population lockdown, sometimes enforced due to COVID-19 in a context where interconnectedness is limited in a face-to-face -face interaction and virtual connectivity is challenged by infodemic of fake news and in some authoritarian states, mass citizen surveillance is the norm. Of course, the, the lockdown has paralyzed the connectiveness 
between people and has limited the, the connections. So in a way, I think we are now saying and repeating, repeating, repeating how terrible has been the consequence of the lockdown. And we all agree that there are terrible consequences. But it would be interesting also to see what have the, been the positive effect of the lockdown. For instance, we have evidence now that in mental health, uh, people have found uh, innovative ways of togetherness, innovative way of sharing uh, opinion, of sharing, but this, the same webinar we are doing now is a way of uh, um, rethinking that the social distancing and the physical distancing are not the same concept. We are now physically distant. I am in Geneva and you are in Lugano. But we are not necessarily uh, socially distant, distant because we are now connected with a very lively and animated discussion. So, of course, uh, the deep democracy the best, the best, the best environment for deep democracy is not the lockdown. This is obvious, and uh, not say. But I think that we should start also thinking the way that people have coped with the, with the lockdown, the way people have innovated or invented strategies to maintain or keep relationship, because. Otherwise, we are just seeing the dark side of the lockdown and we are in a way ignoring. So we have an, uh, another question. It's from uh, Vidondo Beatriz from Bet Suisse. And uh, in Spain, numerous medicalized hotels plus 5,000 beds in the Mesgelende or fairgrounds were set up in a few days for COVID-19 patients. So there was a full response outside the hospitals. Patients were also hospitalized in their homes with doctors visiting them. Community helped by bringing food to those who stayed at home with a highly transmissible disease. Community care will not be advisable. You need either a family member or professional uh, personnel. And uh, the same person asked uh, even, would you say that Spain reacted better than Italy to the COVID pandemic? No, I, I, I don't have any serious or evidence-based opinion on how Spain reacted. And uh, what I can say is that the countries like uh, Japan or South Korea, or in some, some way also Germany, responded with more uh, capacity of uh, involving the primary care level and the community level in an intelligent way, uh, not creating, of course, if, if the problem is to create in an hotel the same crowdy uh, situation than in an hospital, of course, this is not the solution. So I have no opinion on how the Sp Spanish uh, manage their own crisis. I have a very clear opinion how bad the Lombardy and the north of Italy managed our, because the number of the avoidable deaths in uh, elderly residences and the fact that not severe cases instead of being treated at home have been treated in hospital putting them in a very critical situation uh, this is for, for sure was not a good answer and and the and the probably the Lombardy has been the worst among the Italian regions I I, I don't dare to comment on other nations, because really I don't have enough information to make any judgment or any assessment. So I have no opinion, but I am convinced that the intelligent management of community response and of primary care response uh, could save a lot of lives and avoid avoidable death. Thank you, Professor Saraceno. We have another question. This comes from uh, Mike Nzini. The pandemic of COVID shows that the health system, health professional, is part of the community. Is there a way of modifying the triangle and move the health professionals closer to the community? Because we see with this pandemic that health professionals are affected by the crisis 
even more than the patients sometimes. What is, what is there, the new model after the experience of COVID? This is the third time when a problem affects both health professionals and general population. Well, I'm talking about uh, empowerment of other stakeholders of the health dimension. I mean that the health dimension is not just limited to the important component represented by health professionals. I think that the problem is not moving the health professionals towards the community, but maybe simply to empower citizens, uh, which are very often treated as children by the health systems, by passive children, instead of being active citizens. So I think now, of course, we are using the COVID as an example, as a sort of uh, um, uh, emergency situation. We can't use the COVID emergency as a model to reorganize and rethink the health system. So if we think of the health system in a normal situation, without the, the crisis of the pandemic, I think that we see that the power of hospital and the power of health professionals is uh, in a way overwhelming the power and the capacity of having a say of the general population and of the communities. And I think a rebalancing this power will create, will allow a, a more healthy health system. Healthy mean means more democratic and essentially where citizens are in a way part of the decision-making process. Who decides what at what time an ambulatory of a general practitioner should open? We are serving the needs of the general practitioners who decide to open at nine o'clock and closing at five o'clock. But maybe for a family or a member or for a worker, it would be more important that the ambulatory is open in the evening because this has allowed this person to come back from work and to go to the doctor at eight o'clock or nine o'clock in the evening. What I'm saying is that what is the weight and the, in, the, the relevance of the say of the needs of citizens in deciding how the mental the health system is structured, how it worked, how it is organized uh, in terms of timing, in terms of bureaucracy, in terms of administration. All this decision is completely controlled by providers and not by consumers. I think that consumers need to have a say about the organization of the health system. Thank you, Professor Saraceno. We have another question. This comes from uh, Musa Lawrence Lewis. And uh, he's asked, uh, have there been any insights into reasons why trajectories seen elsewhere are different to those seen in Africa, where both institutional level, such as clinics, hospitals, and community level responses, such as social distancing, isolation facilities, at home are virtually non-existing. It's puzzling also that from the equilateral triangle mentioned, one could say that the individual community is the only one strong, neither the administration nor health professionals. What can be learned at global level? Is it is a $1 million question? Um, I don't, my, that my, my sincere answer is I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't believe it is very useful to talk about global level because global means that there are no differences. I think it's more important to learn lessons from local level because I think that the problem that is facing Africa with uh, maybe a weak health system or maybe a strong community um, organization with the presence of traditional healers, for example, or with the rural remote villages, which are completely different from concentrate big, huge urban areas. So I think the notion of global may be misleading 
because what you need to face this crisis in Los Angeles is completely different from what you need in Nepal. So I think that the first thing is to try to think locally. For once, I know that the, it's on fashion to say, think globally, act locally. But I think we have to think locally, act locally, because globally, what we can say at global level is that we are doing a, a, a tremendous effort to research a vaccine. Uh, this, is a, this is a global effort or there are global guidelines coming from WHO or from global agencies. That's fine. But if we want to improve the responses at local level, we should look at the local weaknesses of the health systems and the local strength of the health systems. Because sometimes, and paradoxically, in low-income countries, the, the poverty of the health systems does not mean automatically that there is equal poverty of the community organization. Sometimes community are stronger and more effective than in uh, uh, more affluent countries or in more huge, large urban areas. So uh, my recommendation would, would be to think locally and to act locally to understand the, the lessons to be learned from this tragedy. Okay. Thank you, Professor Saraceno. Uh, at the moment, no other question, and we run out of time. So I think that I can leave to Marlene Hebb. Okay. Thank you very much. And I think it was quite a lively and also challenging discussion. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, particularly, Professor Saraceno. It was, to me at least, very inspiring and I think bringing up some key issues which we have to reflect a lot about in order to find a the right approaches. And thanks also for everybody who had patience to, for on our side to solve the technical challenges. So with this, let's close this plenary of today. Let me just I've, thank Madam Chair for her kind presentation and her kind action as a moderator in this com complex <laughs> environment. So thank you very much for your help and your assistance and thanks to, to Professor Selms and for the inviting me to this lecture. Thank you to everybody. Thank you and goodbye. Goodbye.